Good morning from our Vienna office. For those who don't know me, may I shortly introduce myself. My name is Birgit Kramer. I'm partner uh, with Wolf Teich, and I'm more than happy to host this joint webinar with CBRE. Uh, due to the large number of viewers, you will only see the speakers. Um, the whole uh, webinar will be recorded and you also have the possibility to um, ask questions and submit them online. Please do so and we will try to get all of them answered. Topic of today's webinar is COVID-19 and the effects of the pandemic on European real estate markets, facts, trends and outlooks. Actually, when we were first uh, preparing this webinar, I was quite optimistic that uh, we will slowly get back to normal. Uh, as of today, we seem to be in the middle of uh, the second wave. New restrictions are in place. Almost half of Europe is no longer allowed to, to visit Vienna. Um, new lockdowns are discussed and many companies tell their employees to stay away at home until a vaccine is found. So basically, also, we were hoping against hope that we would talk about real estate markets post-COVID. We will have to deal with real estate markets in the midst of the COVID crisis. And so far, we have already seen many impacts on the real estate business. Home office has become common, making uh, the need for office a slump. In retail, online versus brick and mortar uh, went to a next decisive round. Digital solutions such as contactless egg elevators, for example, are booming. Demand for apartments uh, with outdoor spaces is rising. And tourism has become um, more local, while cities really suffer from, uh, from tourists not visiting um, the countries. And the crisis does not even spare the most um, prestigious trademarks. So last week, the Hotel Sache, for example, uh, announced the dismissal of 140 employees. Um, the expert today of um, the, uh, these topics will be Andreas Rieder, Managing Director Austria and CE of CBRE, who is going to talk about the asset class office. Good morning, Andreas. Good morning, Birgit. Uh, Walter Wölfler. Head of Re uh, Retail Austrian CE of CBRE, who will tell us more about the impact on retail. Good morning. Good morning, Birgit. Good morning, everybody. Georg Fichtinger, Senior Director and Head of Investment Properties of CBRE, who will give a brief overview on the investors' view. Good morning. Good morning. And finally, Peter Oberlechner, partner Wolf Dice, who will give us some legal insights. Good morning. Uh, so let's start uh, with the offices. Has demand for offices slumped? Will rents drop? Are businesses delaying signing new leases? And are tenants asking for further incentives so far? What, what is your view on this, Andreas? Okay, thank you, Birgit, for the introduction. Uh, when most European countries uh, locked down this March, uh, most companies that were in the uh, ask their office staff to stay home. And I think everybody was surprised how well things worked. There were some technical glitches here and there in the beginning, but after a few days of office workers who were working at home, they had their own private issues, but from a business point of view, it really worked well. And uh, then gradually journalists began began to write all over the world, is that the death of offices, do we still need offices and who, who still needs offices if all this works in the, during the lockdown so perfectly well. Uh, the, the journalists were also helped by a, a slump in office demand during the first half. So demand for offices in Europe in the first half of this year compared to the first half of last year on average went down by 35%. There were some Obviously, differences when we look at CE, Bratislava was the most stable one. They only had a 6% reduction. The Baltics, 13%. Warsaw, only 16%. On the other hand, in CE, Bucharest was the, the city with the biggest decline of 60% less demand in the first half compared to, to last year. Um, 
the uh, rents were surprisingly stable and, and still are. So there are even cities in Europe where rents have risen and still are rising this year. Amsterdam, Paris uh, leading and London, uh, for example, rents are falling, but London, there are probably other reasons as well, not just COVID why rents are falling. Vacancy rates are also surprisingly stable in, in most cities. In Vienna, even rents have gone, uh, uh, vacancy rates has, has gone down slightly uh, during the first half. And London, again, is the city with the steepest rise in vacancy in the first half by 5.1%. And in Vienna, for example, we are just signing a lease at a big lease in the city center for 25 euros, which is our prime rent. So it confirms the prime rent in, in Vienna is uh, unchanged. Um, when you now think about, uh, do we still need uh, an office? There's one or two stories I like to tell. So one is, think about a young uh, graduate from a top European university and she gets two offers from two companies. The one company says you, you can start on the first in our fantastic uh, office with all the amenities and technical uh, uh, equipment and all the interesting great uh, colleagues from all over the world who meet there every day. And the other offer is from a company that says for the first two years you can work from home and, and then we will see how it uh, will continue. Just imagine which offer uh, she likely would accept. And the other story is imagine a 40 year old middle management man who gets called to his into his boss office and the boss says i have great news from you from monday on you will never have to come back to the office again you can work for the rest of your career from home imagine how this man will feel what he will feel about his future career about his uh, uh, possibility to to have uh, to get better jobs and, and have a, an upwards career uh, yeah, so um, these are obviously just uh, soft facts. What, what we uh, definitely assume is that offices will change and will have to change because of home office being much more broadly applicable now. When you look, home offices, obviously it existed before in last year in Europe, about 10 to 20 percent of companies have offered their employees to work from home. Uh, at least one day per week. Um, now, I assume that there are hardly any companies in Europe who do not offer home office to, the, to their staff. Uh, so we assume home office will be more popular in the future and that will lead to different offices. Uh, so you don't come to the office anymore just to type all day or to do a research project on the internet. You do that from home. You come to the office because you want to meet with people, you want to brainstorm, you want to do creative things. And for that, you don't need uh, eight desks in, in one group next to each other and then one, one group after the other after the other. You need offices that help and enhance the creative meeting atmosphere with lots of uh, canteens, bar areas, etc. Et we also assume that the location of offices will uh, uh, change slightly. So we assume you will not have only one headquarter office, let's say in Vienna on Hauptbahnhof, one big office. You probably will see smaller offices maybe in the south of Vienna and, and in the north of Vienna to allow their staff to commute in for specific tasks if and when needed. Uh, Co-working is also interesting. Co-working was obviously the big star of office demand over last years. For example, in Paris last year, 30% of all new office contracts signed were from co-working providers like Regis Spaces, WeWork. Um, in the first half of this year in Paris, the demand from co-working providers was 0%. So the demand, uh, they, they have their issues, but for the users, they have proven really helpful because they always rented those offices to have flexibility. Many of them use this flexibility now and, and canceled their co-working contracts. But for the long term, the concept has proven successful. 
So in summary, um, it seems to be clear that we will need offices in the future. Nobody doubts that, but it seems to also to be a fact that how the office will be used in the future and how the office will look in the future will be very different from what it looks today. Uh, I now hand over back to Birgit. Thank you. Many thanks for this insight. Uh, maybe let's talk about the next asset class. Actually, when the pandemic started in mid-March, we were facing many questions as to rent reductions in the retail sector. And for, from what I've seen, most international uh, landlords settled with their tenants as they understood that their long-term uh, relationship depends on smooth settlement in time of crisis, whereas smaller landlords were less compromising. But in the end, at least I settled all rent discussions uh, except one which landed before the, uh, before the courts. Walter, retail had its weaknesses already before the pandemic. So how will this market develop? Okay, thanks Birgit. Uh, very good question. Uh, it's my pleasure to give you a bit of an overview about the retail market as it is now and then uh, go into the question you posed uh, to look at the consequences uh, for the future. Uh, maybe a bit about the status first. Uh, the good news is that uh, almost all retail and leisure is uh, open again in, in entire Europe, so that's, that's good news. The bounce back in footfall uh, after the lockdown uh, is varying uh, between countries. Uh, Austria, Switzerland, Czech Republic, uh, we are uh, already very close uh, to the footfall numbers which we had in uh, 2019 uh, on average uh, in the, let's say, last month, uh, August, uh, also September. Uh, Germany is close behind us. Some countries in Europe, uh, in particular Spain and also uh, the UK, are lagging uh, behind. Uh, of course, there are reasons for it. If you look uh, at specific types of retail assets, uh, you could see that uh, especially retail parks uh, and also uh, secondary cities are trading uh, already at 2019 levels uh, in terms of footfall or even above. Uh, so we could see a, a quite a revival of neighborhood shopping, which was maybe not expected, whereas uh, cities relying on tourism or large uh, shopping centers with a huge uh, leisure and food and beverage amount are uh, suffering. So scale, leisure, also business and tourism uh, at the moment for no-goes uh, for this. Uh, the good news, nevertheless, is that the conversion rate uh, and the average ticket increased. What does that mean? Uh, the turnover result is better than the footfall result compared to last year, and that's a trend almost in entire Europe. So, for instance, if the footfall is at minus 20% at a given uh, time, in, in uh, the, the turnover is only minus 10%. So, that, that's a room. Around, uh, um, a rule of thumb, which we can see. Um, of course, during the lockdown, especially uh, online uh, exploded. So the, the retailers did uh, twice or three times or even more of the turnovers uh, they typically do. And also small shops uh, not used to online shopping accommodated uh, quite quickly uh, to this necessity. Uh, and uh, also baby boomers started to uh, order more uh, online than they did before. And I talked to several retailers who told me that their online business was the key for them uh, to survive. Uh, after the reopening of the physical stores, obviously the online amount went down, but without doubt uh, it will be uh, in future on a higher level than it was uh, pre-COVID. Uh, Birgit already mentioned the discussions between landlords and, and retailers uh, about the so-called COVID annexes. I also have to say that I'm of the same opinion. Uh, surprisingly, despite of different legal preconditions in, in the different countries, 
the majority of landlords and retailers found an agreement, uh, which is uh, very good news. Um, but there are new uh, trends which have to be negotiated legally. Uh, this is now COVID clauses uh, have to be implemented. Of course, online clauses are still a big topic. Break clauses are requested by the retailers. So there is also enough legal stuff uh, to, to deal with in future. At the moment, of course, uh, uh, we have an increase in, in COVID cases. So the fear of the impact of a, a second wave uh, is prevailing. That's, that's uh, still here. What are the consequences or potential consequences for the future? Uh, first and utmost, uh, the trend to online and in particular to omni-channeling uh, has been accelerating a lot. Uh, many retailers saw that they could do good turnovers via online. However, many of them also saw that the margins are suffering. So they keep on investing into the omni-channel uh, world, uh, giving them, uh, first of all, uh, via the physical stores, uh, they know that they can reach also more customers uh, online, uh, the so-called halo effect, uh, which many of you are aware of, I think. And also they can have better margins because uh, the customers come to a click and collect into the store and uh, do their returns in the store. So it's not as costly uh, as it, uh, it was in future. So going forward, it's, it's insignificant where the turnover comes from. Uh, they treat all channels equally. Uh, and of course, this leads to a second consequence. Uh, all retailers are very cautiously looking at their store portfolio and try to restructure it in the best possible way. So they want to have store where it's needed. They want to have stores in a size uh, which is necessary to display the brand and necessary to implement their omnichannel strategy. Uh, this combined with some uh, insolvencies, which we'll see, we'll see most probably uh, beginning of next year when all these governmental support uh, programs are over uh, leads to of course uh, higher vacancy we will see higher vacancy for sure we will have a pressure on rents especially uh, on uh, rents for larger uh, formats uh, that's that's what we can also feel and finally one consequence has also uh, been that the pressure to redevelop reposition or even repurpose retail assets has been accelerating. Uh, of course, uh, you could see or you could hear about already uh, large examples from the US where uh, schools or Amazon took over uh, the spaces of department stores who failed. Uh, and uh, it can be expected that uh, similar repurposing uh, will be needed for some uh, weaker retail assets uh, in Europe, in our countries as well. That's uh, uh, the situation and, and some potential consequences in a nutshell. Uh, I now hand over back to Birgit. Well, many thanks um, to, um, to everyone listening to us. You still have the possibility to ask questions, to submit them online. And we will also start a survey to make your work a little bit. Um, the first question would be, is the pandemic rather an accelerator for changes that would have happened anyhow, or a password for totally new changes? And the other question would be, which asset class, according to you, is most interesting for investors now? And um, I hand over to um, um, Andreas, who is, uh, to, sorry, to Georg, who is going to talk about the investors' um, view. Well, thank you, Birgit. So welcome also from my side. So maybe my initial statement is, so far it has not been so bad than expected uh, on the investment side. So when I look back, the last six months, we already started with a lockdown. Our office, we had already home office six months ago. There was a lot of nervousness in the market, but also inside our company, I would say every, every company, every, every business was affected at that time. 
Um, nobody knew how the market would proceed. We, in our firm internally, we, we also started to, to cut down the, the budgets we, we set up early, uh, late 2019. Um, we were quite negative, to be honest, locally from the international side. People, our people from London and from the US, they were even more negative, and so the, there was, I would say, really a bad, a bad, a bad uh, feeling. Um, and at that, at that time, we also had to uh, to make our forecasts for the yields, and we were quite negative. So we said in every asset class, the yields would rise, and we only differentiated and say they are the, the better and core, more core products would would lose not that much value while other not core product would lose more value. So what are the observations in the first weeks? We haven't seen, um, when I, th I think back on, on March, April, even May, parts of May, we have no new deals coming to the market, which was not really a surprise. Everybody was more or less uh, shocked and there was the shock wave was going on for, I would say, six, seven, eight months or weeks. Um, what we also saw that deals, there were deals ongoing before COVID started, that the lockdown started. These deals were mainly ongoing. The, the, the processes took much longer because visits were not possible. There were not, not no meetings in person possible as many, many investment deals are done by foreigners. But the good thing was that the new ways of communication for many of us, and we're doing the same now at the moment, uh, worked out and it worked out very well. My personal opinion, I, I had really, I switched over from person meetings to Zoom meetings at that time, at mid of, of March, and uh, it was uh, a great communication tool for us. And, and we, we, we could at least keep our relationships with our clients on a very, on a very intensive, on a good way. Another observation was, uh, so mid, early, early, early April, I was for the first time since 2008, again approached by opportunistic buyers, even buyers which are normally not in the market. They called me and, and asked me, is there anything to buy or we, we think now there might be a time to or the, the time is, is quite, it's, it's quite near for us, so we think it's quite near that there could be upcoming opportunities. Um, in comparison to 2009, where we didn't see any of these opportunities, uh, I, I think there might be some opportunities for these opportunistic buyers, maybe at the end of this year, uh, but I'm sure there, were, there might be some opportunities early in 2021. Uh, another observation was um, during these negotiations, some buyers tried to, to get COVID discounts. The, the, the price was already agreed on this price. Exclusivity was, was given and, and uh, negotiations were done. Uh, COVID started and the lockdown started. Some buyers wanted to have discounts. These discounts were, they asked for 5 to 10 percent. And I would say every second deal happened without uh, any discount. Others happened with a discount of, I would say, 5 to 10 percent. Since May, um, we see the market uh, getting much more stable again. Uh, it was a time when the first countries, also like Austria, started to reopen the lockdown or the, the re really restrictive lockdown. and. We also started after internal discussions, after discussions with our clients um, to market new investment product um, because also there was COVID and, the, and this lockdown in, in most of the countries. Uh, demand from investors was quite good and, and we, we saw there's enough equity in place which has to be invested in any case. So um, I, I would like now to, to focus on the on the on this on these sectors on the different sectors, I want to start with the with the losers uh, of COVID so far and to allow a positive end. For me personally, but I would say it's uh, 
it's it's quite evident that hotel um, is the is the main loser of 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 COVID. Uh, when I think back three to four years, or let's say five years, hotel was not even a, a, a an, an an own asset class, but it was a kind of an alternative investment scene. But it, it developed to be a really an, an, an asset class, and many investors focused on on hotels and also developers. For for both of them, it was a great story. The developers they only had to to negotiate one operating one lease contract with an operator. Um, there were a lot of operators trying to get into place in Vienna, which weren't in the market so far. The, the investors, they saw the, the hotel investment as, as a great opportunity. You only, have, you only have one tenant. You have this tenant for 15, 20, normally 20, up to 25 years. So a really a great story. Uh, you don't have, or at least they haven't been seen any operating these risks at that time. And uh, hotel was really, I would say, everybody's darling and the yields, uh, fell down to below four percent and which was for me personally i was i was uh, not convinced and i was really sometimes shocked about the expectations developer, developers have on their developments and there i would say we have seen the, the most the most and and yeah, by far most and strongest uh, repricing i would see yields now in a in a range of 75 to 125 basis points up was it before Corona. Um, I would say still, except great core hotels in the city center, which might which might have a better uh, pricing. But beside that, I would say the repricing in the hotel business is by far the strongest, and we I think the market at the moment is 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 more or less zero. On the retail side. Walter gave us a great overview on the on the on the market. What's going on? Um, uh, what we have to say, maybe on the on the investment side, um, retail was not not that in the focus anymore. Or the, the 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 negative trend concerning retail didn't start with with COVID, but it started, I would say, already two years ago. The online sale was a was a big argument for many investors, which made them a little bit shy. On focusing on, on retail, or at least they tried to 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 bring the retail uh, share within their funds down by buying other things or selling off some of the retail stuff. We have we have seen or we see three different types of retail, also on the investment side, and I would say the, the let's say slightly we know we'll say at least at the at the, at the same level as pre-covid i would say the retail warehouse park, parks is neighboring shopping as Mar as walter mentioned already before they they were uh, i would say the, the most demanded and i would say the, the most frequented also during covid and we also saw when well, not that much but we saw at least some deals and I would say that the yield is more or less stable, and there shouldn't have been a big, uh, a big um, move in yields for retail warehouse parks, shopping centers, uh, especially during the lockdown. Visitors were missing. We all heard the stories from Walter. In the meantime, this story recovered, which is great. Uh, nevertheless, shopping center investors are. In terms of number, I would say by far less than two years ago. Therefore, we we see a slightly discount, and we would say, if I have to give a number, I would say 25 to 50 basis points up uh, in comparison to pre-COVID. On the high street retail side, which which has been always a, a, a big focus for also international tenants, um, we we still see, especially the lux luxury brands suffering due to the lack of tourists coming to the cities, but uh, it's not only a, a Viennese theme, it's a theme for every tourist location. And uh, we see also here that the, the yields going up slightly up to, I would say, 25 basis points. Uh, I would now like to turn over to the positive side. Um, and it's, it's, 
even more positive than we saw. I personally am a, normally an optimistic guy, but I was I was really astonished on the on the office developments on the off was on the development of the office investment market. Um, we were quite sure that there might be a problem or it, there might be a stronger repricing for for average office product. Uh, but nevertheless, we saw also good demand from investors for, for average product. I mean, therefore, uh, location, which is not really the, the prime location, um, not a, a vault of, of 10 years, but also leases up to three to four years. And we, we saw really good competition coming out from the investors. And I would therefore say that the yield in this um, was more or less the same. The, 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 the expected yield in increase didn't happen, and this was really a, a big surprise for me. Um, what we, an observation we made on, on offices, it is that volume is crucial again. So when I think back on 2000, after the last crisis uh, in 2010, 2011, in 2012, we tried to market a, a bigger office property with a volume of about 150 million and we we were really struggling to find a buyer and also really big investors already invested in Vienna. They said no 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 deal of, of above 100 million in Vienna so which was at that time really hard and as I thought for the future this might be really a big problem. We saw in the past this this wasn't anymore a problem then we saw deals up to 500 and even above 500 million. But now, I don't know if this is an, an, an observation, which is all a, a, a reason of COVID, but we see investors being now more um, cautious also on volume again. Um, so the, 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 the great, uh, <coughs> the, the, the preferred range is, 30 to 70 million and so every, every, to everybody who is listening to us and who would like to sell an office building or whatever we are happy to to, uh, to help him and would be really happy um, maybe we see on the on the core office side maybe this i have to add the core office side we haven't seen any decrease in yields but we have seen a, 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 a downturn on yields is ongoing and I would say for, for core office product, the yields are between 10 to 20 basis points below the beginning of this year. The logistics market in, in Austria is still a very small market, becoming, but becoming much more important. One thing is there's a big this, this former big gap in land price compared to Slovakia and Hungary diminished. Uh, labor costs in the neighboring countries also accelerated, therefore, uh, especially the region around Vienna, north, east, and south, uh, were come into, uh, came into the focus of developers. And on the one hand, on the other hand, the, the demand from, from logistic tenants uh, was better even um, accelerated by COVID. For example, we, we represented a company who had the, the, the warehouse in Hungary, but after the lockdown, they were not able to bring in the, the, the products to Austria. And so they, they couldn't, couldn't deliver any more goods. And they now decided to have their products also in Austria based, which, which led to a, a, a a leasing of 10,000 square meters warehouse for this for this tenant for this company. Uh, saying that, I can say that the, the the yields for logistics have decreased us since the beginning of this year by 10 to 25 basis points, and I'm quite sure that we will see for super super core trophy assets on the logistics side. Um, maybe a, a yield below 4% later this year. This is our, let's see. Um, the, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite,
interest in what uh, what will come out on the on the server because we 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 started five ten minutes ago. My my personal uh, winner stable winner is residential. There is enormous demand from investors still, and we still have a very good supply. There's a lot of developments coming to the market. So the positive things and the positive arguments for investors are it's a, it's a stable income. You have limited planting and vacancy risks, and all, also you have a lot of a number of tenants, which is at the first at the first thing at the first on the first few quite um, quite difficult. Um, it's now seen as, as much more comfortable than it has been seen. I would say even for before Corona, when you could compare hotel to residential. Nevertheless, residential has been a a, a, a big um, investment target for the last two to three years and also German and international money flew into this market and into this sector. Um, the yields the yields are falling in, in on the residential side, also not that much falling than often the expectation of developers would uh, would like to see them. So the developers are even more ambitious and more uh, and yeah, but I think the market is, is very good and we see basis points minus 10 to minus 20 percent, uh, minus 20 basis points up to uh, concert, uh, compared to the beginning of the year. Uh, what's the current situation and also my summary? Um, there is further strong demand. Local investors are again in the market, which is a quite uh, user, which is quite new. So in, in the in the in the in the current situation, we see the real local money coming into the market again and wants to be invested in, in offices, especially. Um, Germans have problems to come over to to Austria at the moment due to these restrictions, but I hope this won't have a long-term impact. On one hand. And a lot of this German money is already invested in the market, so they have the people already, the local people on the ground, and and they can, I would say, solve this problem. And assuming these restrictions won't last too long, this shouldn't have a big effect, in my personal opinion. International money, like Korean money, we they they have been a big player in the market already. They are at the moment they can't be seen in the market. A second. Um, observation or a second thing I, I want to mention is I am quite sure opportunities will arise uh, due to more difficult financing so banks are getting more restrictive and there are buyers with a lot of pocket money in um, and they are ready to buy and to go so we will see opportunities coming to the market and opportunity deals I would say 2021. Uh, and my last comment is most sectors see pressure on yields, especially core products, these no brainers. They, we will see new record lows uh, later this year and I would say also in 2021. Thank you for that. And I would now like to hand over and back to. Well, thank you for um, for these insights. Maybe before we go to the legal aspects, uh, we have some questions here. And the first one, good morning, Mr. Weibel, actually, um, is addressed to Mr. Wölfler. Prime retail assets in the first district in Vienna depend on tourism arrivals and face challenges as they can't easily compensate with online sales. Uh, what is the effect on building valuation in city centers like Vienna and what would it mean for it if tourism isn't coming back in two to three years? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, Vienna is of course benefiting uh, and, and relying on tourism. However, on the short term, uh, the good news is that the city center of Vienna, the first district, is quite small and there has been a substantial waiting list of retailers uh, wanting to come into this area. So it's in particular in the luxury area, 
uh, despite their drops in turnovers, uh, there are lots of retailers waiting for each and any opportunity uh, to secure uh, a location in, in Kolmagda or uh, at the upper end of the Graben, for instance. Uh, and it's similar at the moment still uh, in Kärntner Straße, uh, where uh, retailers are looking for locations. So in the, in the short term, uh, there is demand. There will uh, some changes happen in the near future where, where tenants rotate, but the, the new tenants uh, are at the moment at the same, almost same uh, rent level than the old tenants. Um, what they do, of course, is thoroughly scrutinizing the opportunities, so uh, the, the, the shape of the building and all the details uh, of the contract and so, and so on are much more important than they used to be uh, some years ago. In the medium term, however, of course, uh, uh, the, the revival or comeback of uh, international tourism is needed uh, in order to keep the rent levels, uh, that's for sure. So Vienna without international tourists uh, wouldn't be able to keep the, the valuations in the long term. Thank you. Um, the next question would be addressed to Andreas. Which technical requirements will come for new offices, such as, for example, touch, touchless access, air circulation systems, etc.? Thank you, Birgit. So one aspect of the change comes from a health perspective, as already mentioned, uh, air uh, filters and uh, touchless access. Uh, also windows, so offices that don't have openable windows feel strange at the moment. And I'm currently in a hotel room in Warsaw and I only get the air from the air condition system and it feels, hmm, where has this air been before and <laughs> what, what kind of quality of air do I get here? Um, there are also some questions about high rise buildings in general, because when you have to enter an elevator with 20 other people going up, uh, some people don't uh, probably will feel uncomfortable for some time. Uh, then there are uh, consequences from the, the shared desk, which will definitely be the future because if people work from, from home more, then they don't need a desk on, on, on their own all week. Uh, so there you need systems to be able to locate where they sit uh, automatically. Uh, then there will be no telephones uh, anymore. So we in our offices don't have hard line telephones anymore because they, they are not regarded as being uh, very healthy to speak into the same phone as others do. And the third area is the conference calls. They obviously work well like Zooms one-on-one, -on -one, but if you have three, four people meeting physically and meeting with other people online, this often doesn't really work well. And there you need much better equipment to make this experience as seamlessly as it's one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And one, thank you. And one last question to Georg. How do you think the rents for residential space in Vienna will, de will develop? Thank you, Birgit. So I think the uh, rental value wouldn't or will not rise that much. I think they will be a, they will stable out and flatten out. Uh, if it's a, an exceptional location, I would see even rent increase. If it's if it's locations like the 21st, 22nd district, I live in the 21st district, so I'm, I'm allowed to say it. I think I think we have. Um, um, we might see also some pressure because there is a lot of competition between developments and I'm not sure if all these uh, lease, uh, leases which are, which are asked for in the, first, in the first round will be achieved in the second round. So I think you have to be also quite... Uh, uh, you have to look really on the micro location, but overall I would say the yields are, are not... they should go so, but in general, we see the rents for, for new product, so first round letting stable, but the problem is more the older uh, flats. And there was also now a question re relating to Airbnb. So there are some statistics that say now the, the Airbnb market and 
uh, that comes now to the normal Latin market represents an entire year of supply of new supply of new apartments and that obviously will have an impact as well on on rents but again on secondary uh, so second time lettings or later lettings not the first time lettings okay um, thank you and uh, let's turn to the <clears throat> legal topics. Um, when the lockdown came, actually, we were facing a lot of new regulations and decrees, and still are, and new questions uh, of our clients, such as, can I travel to Vienna to visit the site? Uh, where do we have to wear masks? Um, how many people are allowed in the shop? Can I open my shop? Can I open the cinema? Um, how many people are allowed on a table in a restaurant, etc. And we were also thinking about new clauses in our contract. So, uh, Peter, maybe you can give us more insights on that. Yes, gladly. But first of all, let me uh, thank you, uh, the CBRE team, for uh, the valuable market insights that you have given. Because for us lawyers, it is basically the industry that shapes our reality as lawyers and not the other way around. So all the trends that you described are basically uh, influential and decisive for what we do and for what we will have to do in future. And that's what I'm going to speak about. Well, um, Birgit and uh, probably all others on the call, I, I may have to disappoint you when you expect me to run through all the countless legal regulations that we have been confronted with since the onset of the crisis, not only in Austria, but throughout the entirety of Central and Eastern Europe. It's a patchwork of um, stuff that we're confronted with, concerns tax accounting, concerns the ban of eviction of, uh, uh, of, of tenants, uh, standstill provisions for the enforcement of loans, uh, state aid provisions uh, for the for cost contribution for fixed cost of tenants and the like. So this is kind of really a unfortunately and sadly probably uh, again uh, this this harmonized and uh, kind of uh, confusing, framework of legal regulations that we are confronted with throughout Europe. What I will do and what I will try to do is rather focus on larger trends and undercurrents that are presently affecting real estate, real estate related contracts and transactions. So to say mega trends that we see in the legal world. And uh, I think as, as has become clear from, uh, from, uh, from the uh, uh, presentations of uh, the experts of CBRE before, not all of what we currently see is really attributable to, uh, to the COVID-19 crisis, but COVID-19 has served and is still serving as an accelerator to several developments that we are seeing that may have happened anyhow, but in a, at a slower pace. Now, I personally would spot four major, what I would describe as mega trends in this, uh, uh, in our little world of lawyers. Uh, the first mega trend uh, that is hugely affecting everything is the digitalization of real estate and of everything that has to do with real estate. I'm not speaking about Zoom conferences now like the one that we're on now that has that have become quite customary for not only for transformation of knowledge, but also for negotiations and for entering into transactions. What I'm speaking about is the need for fully fledged digitalization of real estate assets. For instance, to allow for 3D visits, 3D virtual property site visits of properties that are currently based on travel restrictions, etc., really hard to visit for investors, for the people to have to carry out the due diligence. I think that this is really a need to do for owners uh, of real estate to have that taken care of. 
Another fact that affects us as lawyers is that we see that there is an increasing count of permanently maintained complete virtual data rooms established for real estate. Uh, not of what you currently see uh, on the usual platforms, but so that you really have the ability to turn around your property or to refinance it in a snapshot without, without having to before that uh, collect data, information, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a need that we see. And what we also see is that in, there is increasingly uh, 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 the use of web-based digital tools uh, as transactional spaces for carrying out transactions. No longer emails flying around forth and back, but having a transaction occur in a uh, kind of a virtual data room where the right people have access to, where the uh, uh, most up-to-date version of a contract is always online and available for input on all sides, etc. Um, all of uh, us and you who are interested in prop tech see uh, the developments that are happening in this field. I think this is in difficult times like the ones or extraordinary times, let's put it like that, that we're currently living in, really a call of the time not to miss this train that allows for efficient cross-border work and transaction, even though travel restrictions uh, and impediments may be in place for a, unfortunately, maybe extended uh, period of time. The second mega trend that I would be spotting is uh, a uh, what I would relate to as a real paradigm shift in commercial lease contracts. Now, uh, Walter, uh, you spotted uh, and rightly mentioned some of the features and elements that these uh, new contracts have and the background for the reasons for this paradigm shift. Uh, the, generally, what we see is that contract terms are getting shorter, irrespective of whether it's office leases or retail leases. Uh, there is always the demand, the demand for more flexibility, more break rights, more flexibility in terms of time and space on grounds of the uncertainty that tenants are confronted with in many reasons nowadays. Uh, this all leads to a, uh, uh, to, a, to a situation where the need for large areas that are leased for a long time, as we see, it, decreases. Uh, this has nothing to do with the fact that offices, for instance, uh, that offices and retail space clearly are and will still be important, but they will have to be set up and managed in a different way than they were before. Home office uh, was mentioned, uh, uh, um, uh, and I, I found Andreas' uh, examples uh, really good and absolutely correct. Uh, uh, home offices uh, will not take over the role of, uh, of existing brick and mortar, traditional office buildings, but clearly they will play an increasing role for various reasons. Uh, so all this also needs to more the demand for more flexibility as regards office space. Uh, last not least, uh, in retail leases, online multi-channel sales, improved sales logistics also are leading to the need for smaller outlets. It's increasingly difficult to rent out large uh, off retail areas that may become vacant. And there is another thing that uh, we find to be uh, uh, kind of a, a fact in retail leases, base rent and minimum rent concepts are increasingly being substituted by turnover only leases. So the bottom line is that lease contracts basically for all asset classes uh, have undergone a transformation, a silent transformation in uh, various respects and the models of the past will no longer work in the future. The third, I would say the third mega topic that I see uh, in the legal world is that there is a new and sharpened look at risk 
and risk allocation. Now, we all remember uh, the old days, the days before uh, COVID. Uh, we all remember uh, how short it took to ultimately have a force majeure clause in a contract, right? That was kind of the least important thing to have and to do. And people were confident that uh, uh, the clause would basically hardly ever materialize because all the scenarios that are covered by these clauses were just not uh, the case. Uh, then uh, COVID-19 came and uh, this discussion took a, an entirely different twist. Uh, everybody was asking uh, whether or not uh, the virus in itself is force majeure and what effects it would have on whatever type of contracts starting with construction contracts. You remember construction sites were shut, construction companies regularly claimed force majeure to no longer be able to uh, continue construct construction pro pro projects. Uh, there were access restrictions to retail uh, premises and there was the question by landlords and by tenants, is this force majeure for me or for the tenant or for both of us? In Austria, as you all know, we are in the situation that we have some sort of, I would say, legal framework to deal with this situation, but it's murky and unclear altogether. There have been tons of articles uh, and opinions on, on the issue, to what extent tenants might be able for rent reduction or not. Uh, I think the sensitive route that was taken is Austrian approach, find a consensus, sit down, talk, look into the future, achieve a consensus and not wait for Supreme Civil Court decisions that uh, may be uh, so to the surprise of everybody and that may last a long time to achieve. Situation was different in Central and Eastern Europe where no such statutory provisions uh, like the one that we had in our favorite, that we have in our federal civil code are, are in the codes, but still the situation was the same. And also there we see that landlords and tenants sit together, sit together and talk. Uh, financing agreements, uh, the same issue here. Uh, is the crisis, was the crisis uh, uh, a reason to call a material adverse change? Uh, entitling lenders to uh, just uh, uh, wipe out a loan. Um, this has not yet been finally tested by any court, to my, to my uh, information. The prescribed loan to value ratio in loan agreements, in many cases, kind of dropped below the freezing point. Uh, but the issue remained, whose fault was this ultimately? Was this really the fault of the defaulting uh, 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 lender uh, uh, to, uh, to have defaulted on the loan? Also there, to my, to my uh, information, no court decisions uh, so far. Also here, the same thing. Uh, lenders, uh, uh, borrowers and lenders sit down and uh, find uh, uh, joint solutions. The question is uh, how Given our legal framework, how would courts of justice decide on such loan defaults that were ultimately inevitable on grounds not attributable to either party? And um, as, as we know, uncertainty is the end of our business. Um, so uh, this is not a situation that is good going ahead. So uh, all post-COVID uh, related real estate, be development agreements, lease contracts, and also financing agreements now contain regulations on what shall precisely be when similar things happen again in future. Lockdowns, access restrictions, uh, restrictions on crossing the borders, etc. you name it. And COVID, last not least, COVID-19 has made us aware that there could also be COVID-20 at the end of the day or similar events uh, in future. So the issue of allocation of risks now plays a significantly more important role in the contractual work before and is given much more weight in contracts. Another 
And this is my fourth point then, uh, uh, mega trend that we see is uh, that buildings, uh, um, and Andreas already mentioned some topics related to this, they have to be epidemic safe or pandemic proof. And that doesn't only con concern uh, offices, uh, retail buildings, it also contains uh, concerns residential, where there is this need for the famous additional room for home office or the balcony or the small garden, et cetera, et cetera. So there is an increased focus on health and safety standards that is clear from the onset on throughout development agreements, lease contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Open space has also been mentioned, has lost some of its appeal. Uh, people are less willing uh, uh, to share offices uh, uh, in kind of uh, when they see how, how the consequences are in the crisis. Uh, air exchange ratio plays a role. Separate ex access possibilities uh, play a role for, for tenants uh, um, because uh, when one elevator has to be shut down, the question is how will other tenants be able to leave uh, their buildings? Touchless has become a kind of a, uh, one of the buzzwords of uh, the post-COVID area. And undoubtedly there will, what we will be seeing is new building certificates that are based on whether or not buildings are epidemic and uh, in other respects, crisis safe. So these were my personal mega trends in the legal, in the legal sense. Question will, when we go back to normal, which is kind of still something light at the end of the tunnel, uh, or however you would want to phrase it, uh, will there be uh, will we be going back to normal again once this is over? And hopefully, it will be one fine day. My personal guess is that the points that I mentioned now they will uh, they will they will stay. They will uh, they will not go away again. These are factors that will determine the shape and the form of uh, uh, the legal landscape uh, in uh, real estate related uh, contracts also in the future. Thank you. And uh, again, back to David. Um, well, thank you, Peter. I think we have uh, another question um, with regards to hotels to Georg, uh, actually, um, you said prime hotels have to be viewed differently from non-city center hotels. Could you please elaborate on that? Uh, could you repeat this question? Sorry. The question was, uh, you said prime hotels have to be viewed differently from non-city center hotels. Could you please elaborate on that? So we have seen in the, in, the, in the past, we have seen a lot of developments or potential put developments which were planned all, I would say, all around Vienna and within Vienna. And I would, I, I would, I would like to exclude maybe the, really the city center core hotels out of my, of my, of my forecast. But beside that, I would say that yields would go up by 75 to 125 basis points on, on average hotel locations. Uh, hopefully this is the answer. Um, well, thank you. There are no more questions. Maybe it would be interesting to see um, our survey and how people answered, if that's possible. So, um, okay, that's interesting. The trend says, um, uh, first question, is the pandemic rather an accelerator for changes that would have happened anyhow or a pathway for totally new changes? 68% think it's uh, an accelerator, whereas 32% are of the opinion it will be a pathway for totally new changes. And with regard to the asset classes, um, the winner, according to the survey, is are uh, logistics, 45%, uh, followed by residential, 36%, um, 
and then followed by office, retail and hotel, which are between 7 and 5 percent. Well, many thanks for, um, for uh, answering just a, this. Just question. a comment. I, I'm really surprised that most of you see offices uh, very similar to retail and hotels. I would have expected offices being a, a little bit more popular than retail and hotel. So interesting. Thank you for that. Um, maybe that will also depend on, on employer laws uh, regulation because I think many people now think about home office and everyone will stay at home but I think in, at the end of the day it won't be that easy with all at least in Austria with all the regulations and actually we have office deals and transactions on the table so I'm yeah. it's, I'm wondering as well. Yeah, I wanted to add that. So from current investment business on our table, we, we don't see that. So we see offices still being very popular, but less so, much less so hotels and retail. Um, so if the viewers don't have any questions, I have maybe a last one to you. What will be different in five, five years from now? Maybe we can start with you, Andreas. Um, yeah, <laughs> so many things, but, but uh, yeah, so in, in offices, definitely more people will work uh, one or two days from home where one year ago, hardly anyone did so. In retail, definitely online will be, will have increased further. Hotels, hopefully everything will be more or less back to normal. Logistics will still uh, continue. Uh, their, their success uh, path. So lots of things that just come to my mind briefly. Thanks, Birgit. Thank you. Uh, Walter? Uh, it's a difficult one. I have a very brave, let's say, uh, suggestion. Uh, what we saw during the crisis is a revival of neighborhood shopping we see that it's much easier now to have online and on the channel link because the hurdles uh, uh, to start this are lower. Uh, we see some pressure of rent on rents, uh, in, in, on retail rents. So my positive uh, uh, outlook or uh, estimation would be that in five years, uh, we see more entrepreneurs running independent retail shops, uh, which brings more variety to the retail. Uh, and, and also close to the communities uh, that we see uh, today. So uh, I would not bet on it, but uh, at least I would like uh, to see it in five years. Okay, thank you. Georg, if you take a view in the crystal, into the crystal. Um, so I'm, I'm quite sure, I don't think I need a crystal ball. I'm quite sure that uh, uh, living in the, in the countryside or maybe outside even the Speckgürtel will be much more attractive and will be much more uh, sought after than it is today uh, because of, of new technologies, because of, of partly home office working. So I think, which I think that's a good, it's a good point. And I think this will come. Thank you, Birgit. Peter, yeah. I'm pretty sure you have something to say. Yeah, that's uh, what, again, also here, uh, our future will basically depend on your future. The, uh, no, but I think there is one safe bet that uh, I can contribute, uh, and that is uh, everything that has to do with digitalization. I think what we will be seeing is uh, more standardized contracts that goes hand in hand with uh, digitalization. Uh, uh, due diligence exercises will be shorter on grounds of uh, our artificial intelligence tools that can be that can be used for various purposes. So I would expect the entire process of I would say what, what the technical aspects of contracts are and whereabouts and bells and whistles to be much simpler in future. This has nothing to do with the fact that it will still take a long time to make a complex transaction work. Uh, and uh, I think there is 
ultimately no way to substitute human brains by machines in our entire industry. Thank you. Well, I think any crisis can also be seen as a chance and many countries are actually thinking about um, um, of this net zero emission recovery programs where they boost the economy and uh, try to get a carbon new neutral economy. So I believe that we will change how we, how we live and we will rethink how we build, live, travel and as an optimist, I think we will give back the word sustainable its, its true meaning. So that, that would be my side for in five years. Um, so if there are no more questions, I think we are actually running out of time anyhow. Uh, many thanks to the speakers. Many thanks for listening. Uh, have a wonderful day and bye bye from Vienna. <laughs>